Hola, bienvenido, and welcome to another episode of Homeowner 101 Workshops. These workshops are dedicated to you, and our goal is to develop your skills and enhance your confidence as a homeowner by protecting your family, your home. You know, that's your most important investment. My name is Antonio Lopez Jr., and I have the privilege of being your host. Now, we truly appreciate you and your time and your commitment to fire safety. By the end of this workshop, I got to tell you, we are going to have an increased awareness and y'all are going to feel more confident, more confident about finding and removing potential fire hazards in your home that you had no idea. What about detecting fires? We're going to do that too. We're going to detect smoke. We're also going to detect carbon monoxide. We're going to learn how to properly use a fire extinguisher and we're going to create a successful fire escape plan for you and everyone in your home. Now, for more detailed instructions, you can also go to homedepot.com. We've got a ton of more additional resources and videos that you're more than welcome to check out. Now, you might be thinking, Antonio, why are you in the middle of your kitchen when this is a workshop about fire safety? And I'm glad you asked. That's because cooking is still the number one cause of home fires. Take a look at that, kitchen fires a huge hazard, and it's so important to stay in the kitchen whenever you are cooking, all right? And keep anything that could potentially catch on fire that's flammable, keep it away from the stovetop. Now, may I ask you a question? Okay, great. You know, what day do you think is the peak day for cooking fires to occur? Hey, if you said Thanksgiving, you're on the money, because that's absolutely right. And there's some other days that come really close to Thanksgiving in terms of cooking fires, Thanksgiving Eve, Christmas Day, Christmas Eve, essentially any major day where people get together and celebrate around food. Really big concern. So it's good to have that top of mind front and center. So what could you do if you did notice a fire in your kitchen on any of these days or even when there's nobody over, All right? So let's take a look. Small stove fires, right? Right behind me, you got a stove. If you got a fire that's happening in a pot or a pan, protect yourself. So put it in an oven mitt, obviously. And if you're able to access the lid, cover that pot or pan with the lid to stuff out that fire and then turn off the stove, right? Now don't remove the pan, that lid, until everything is completely cooled down. All right, now in case of an oven fire, you wanna make sure that you can quickly turn off the heat, all right? Close that door if it is open. Again, safety, safety, safety. And keep the door closed until that has completely cooled down. In terms of that microwave, if you got a fire in there, unplug if possible and keep the door closed as well. Grilling, if you're outdoors using the grill, close it, turn it off, and close any vents if you did uh, have any of the vents open. All right, really important. Now I'll tell you a personal story really quick. Picture this, all right? The year was 2002. And I was in college during winter break when a few friends and, and I, we were like, hey, let's drive from New York City all the way just up a, a little town of, north of, of Montreal, Canada, so that we can have a great time and celebrate each other. Take a break, right? We stayed in this beautiful uh, vacation cabin. It was, I mean, it was gorgeous. And being, you know, young at that time, it was really exciting. It was a brand new adventure. One night, I remember we decided to stay in and cook to save some money. We're college students, right? And well, one of my friends took the initiative and he was like, I'm gonna cook y'all burgers on the stovetop because again, it's winter. So he couldn't cook outdoors on the grill. So he had to cook inside. Well, he was cooking and he might've used this a little bit too much olive oil. And well, olive oil quickly heated, caught on fire. And suddenly we had a mirror image of what you see on that screen right there. Big concern. So fortunately, I saw what happened. I quickly ran to the kitchen. I grabbed a huge container of salt and I just poured it on to that grease fire and stuffed it out. All right, now I'm fortunate because I have my family to thank for that because I learned growing up and that was a little trick in dealing with grease fires. But whatever you do, if you're ever in a situation like that, never put water. Don't put water on a fire that's, that's based on grease because that can actually make it exponentially worse and it can be a, a crazy situation if anything you can use salt 
Uh, baking soda is actually helpful too. Or if you have that handy pan, uh, the pan lid, use that as well. All right. Now we'll talk about fire extinguishers later on because that's another method as long as it's properly rated. All right. So we're going to explore that later in this video. But first, do you know what the second leading cause of home fires are? If you said heating, ding, 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 you're correct because that's the second most common cause of home fires. Now, you want to stay safe when you're staying warm. So here are a few general tips to consider. When using a space heater, you want to make sure it's on a level, non-flammable surface. And I mean something like ceramic tile is great. Not on a carpet, not on a rug. In fact, keep any flammables like clothing, towels, drapes at least three feet away from a space heater heater or a fireplace if you have one. Love fireplaces, but you got to be careful. So if you do have a fireplace, always consider using a fire guard to cover. And also have that chimney inspected annually. All right, it's really helpful, really good. Now, you got another image here that gives me a little anxiety and that's overloading outlets. Don't do that, please avoid that at all costs. That is such a, a that's asking for trouble. So just be careful with that. Now, you also want to be cautious if you are a smoker, just ensuring that cigarettes are completely put out. And if you love candles like I do, I got to tell you, keep them away from any flammable object as well. And never, never, never leave a candle lit alone. In fact, uh, that reminds me, I love these pumpkin candles, but I got to turn them off too. So hold on. Thanks, folks. Well, some of these fire hazards, right, they may seem like common sense. And you're like, Antonio, come on, this is all basic stuff. But one area of your home that may surprise you and might not even be on your radar, think about your dryer, all right? And here's some tips to consider for dryer safety because dryer vents, they can get clogged with lint and dirt. And that's a no-no. I mean, lint and lint is literally, it can serve as, I know people that use lint as kindling or tinder to start a campfire, all right? So that's true. So it's very flammable. So it's important to remove lint regularly to avoid buildup. So that means you should do this at least once a year on that main uh, dryer vent. Now, again, really flammable. So make it a routine and a habit to also regularly clean out the lint trap filter. So that means pull that lint trap filter and clean it out before every cycle, all right? And teach everyone in the home to do that too. All right, consider vacuuming that area too, in and around, because again, that's gonna help mitigate all of that debris of lint that's really flammable, all right? Really good stuff to know. Now, if the lint screen is really clogged up and gunked up with dirt and debris, feel free to take that out, use a, a scrub brush, wash it with warm water, with a little soap, and then rinse it clean, and then make sure to properly dry it. You're gonna be thankful of that, right? You're getting ahead and being proactive, this is really important. Now, if you're out there and you're using dryer sheets, they're great, they smell great. I'm a big fan of dryer sheets, but they do add a little more residue that can stay on the lint screens that can build up over time. All right, now overall, and this is good for your whole home, but especially around the dryer, is sweep that area and dust it around the vicinity. Now, if you're a sport fanatics, you know that sport fanatics will talk about how defense really wins championships, right? Coaches, they'll tell you all the time. And your home's first line of defense is gonna be fire detection. All right, so what do we do with fire detection? It's gonna be like smoke alarms. In fact, here's, a, here's an interesting fact about three out of five fire deaths happen in homes without working smoke alarms. All right, so that means smoke alarms are a key crucial component in protecting because they provide detection. They provide early warning to reduce your risk of dying in a fire. I mean, that's a worst case scenario, right? But that's according to the National Safety Council. So things to consider when you're looking at adding smoke alarms or the smoke alarms within your home, they can come in a battery operated version or hardwired, which hardwired can also have a battery backup. What happens if your power uh, to your house is gonna cut out? You still want a functioning smoke alarm. That's why you need a battery as a backup for a smoke alarm. Now these smoke alarms, they can be interconnected and that'll allow for all the alarms to sound. So if one is triggered, that means all of them are gonna sound, that's giving you additional protection. It might sound like it's, it's a little annoying, 
But trust me, that is going to give you peace of mind down the road. All right. Now, they also double your chance of surviving in a house fire, like I talked about that fact earlier, but they also send smoke or invisible combustion gases in the air. Right? It's going to detect both smoldering fires, flaming fires, because they can differ. And there's actually two types of, of detections that occur with smoke alarms. Ionization is actually better suited to detect smaller, uh, less visible particles sooner than the alternative photoelectric because, again, this is suited or catering towards those flaming fires. It's going to respond better with that. All right. As opposed to the opposite, photoelectric, those alarms detect smoke by using light. It's a light sensor. It uses a light beam, and that is going to be better suited for those smoldering fires. All right. Now, for optimal protection, consider using a combination of both, the best of both worlds. You'll be good to go. Now, your home's defense is even better when you integrate a carbon monoxide detector, which is a colorless, odorless, and toxic gas, all right? This stuff is bad and you can't see it, like I said. Now these detectors, they come in different options, right? They come battery powered, you see, uh, they have hardwired again, but they also have plug-in versions, all right? A standalone carbon monoxide detector, you can just plug it in and you're good to go. Now these come in so many different options, I mean, the technology is getting better and better with each day. And so some have voice alarms, some have a digital display, some integrate a safety light, even have LED light indicators to alert you. All right, that's really great, especially for folks that might be uh, impaired or have some kind of disability. Uh, this is gonna give you that extra assistance. Uh, they, these, some of these also come in a combination, which what I have in my hand right now is, this is a Kitta smoke detector and carbon monoxide detector. So it's a two-in-one, a really great option to consider and look at. Now, we mentioned fire hazards earlier, but what actually produces carbon monoxide risks, right? Like, you're like, Antonio, I don't, I don't have uh, gas appliances in my home. Well, here, let, me just, let me just show you, all right? Because potential sources could be in the form of an appliance malfunction, right? So if you do have a gas appliance, like a gas stove, it could happen from that. It could happen from improper ventilation, burning fossil fuels like oil, gas, coal. Uh, think of a furnace crack, a dryer vent clause, right, that we talked about. A blocked chimney, if you got a chimney, that can all produce CO, an abbreviation, right, of carbon monoxide. And what happens if you inhale carbon monoxide? Well, if you inhale too much, you can start to get flu-like symptoms. All right, so that means it can easily be misdiagnosed. And so as more time passes, is the big problem. Those symptoms can worsen and lead even to death, all right? Not scare tactics, just being honest here. It's good to know, it's good information to be better, uh, more knowledgeable uh, with, these, with these potential risks, right? It's about protecting your family and your home. Now, the great news is that proper placement and installation of these detectors can be extremely effective and enhance your protection. All right, so with smoke alarms, to be effective, you have to just read the labels, folks. Read the labels. That means the labels inside the box. You're going to have instruction manuals. You're going to have stickers on the device itself. Read all that information. It tells you everything you need to know. I promise you. All right. Now, you should test these detectors out monthly. All right. Use daylight savings time even as a reminder to install new batteries on those battery-operated oper detectors. All right. Now, the only exception to that is if you have a newer uh, detector, some are coming with lithium batteries, and those last literally for 10 years, which is the cadence in which you should change out your smoke detectors, all right? Smoke detectors generally need to be replaced every eight to 10 years. Now you wanna install one on every level of the home, uh, typically like outside of the sleeping areas or, or maybe inside those bedrooms if, if you sleep with the, with the doors closed. Uh, inside each sleeping area, like I said, and also on the ceilings or walls, right? Maybe in hallways, right? Install smoke detectors also. Also, this is really important. On the ceiling, all right? If you're gonna do it on, on the ceiling, make sure it's high and it's four inches away from the wall, all right? Tape measure is gonna come in handy. Measure that distance. Make sure that you're at least four inches away from the wall if it's placed on the ceiling. And if it's on the wall, 
You want to be at least four inches away from the ceiling. Now you're going to see some different numbers there throughout. The general rule of thumb is at least four to 12 inches from the ceiling or wall. That just gives you a good gauge. Keep that in mind for proper placement. Now, if you install a smoke alarm in the kitchen, do so at, if you can only do it at least 10 feet away from something like a stove, all right? Because you don't want to get those false alarms, those false triggers. I mean, these smoke detectors are really, really advanced, but you still don't want to put it right here next to your oven, all right? That's just going to not be effective. It's not going to be impactful. At least 10 feet away is the recommendation. All right. Now, in terms of CO alarms, those carbon monoxide detectors, you want to place them outside of every bedroom again and on every level of your home, including the basement, all right? Got a basement in my new home that we just got. Put it down there. All right. Now, to avoid inaccurate readings and false alarms, install CO alarms. Uh, you, you want to do at least 15 feet away from places like a fireplace uh, or maybe a gas stove, a furnace, a gas furnace. That's a really good best practice. Uh, in fact, uh, Kitta uh, mentions that carbon monoxide and combination alarms, they should really be mounted in or near bedrooms, uh, living areas, on walls. This is where they say at least six inches away from the ceiling or uh, six inches above the floor specifically for CO monitors. That's really important for that. All right. Now, if you're mounting on the ceiling again with CO monitors, you want to make sure that it's at least six inches away from the wall. All right. So that's their magic number for carbon monoxide detectors. All right. Now, you know what can make this even easier? What is that, Antonio? Well, what about a map? I got one for you. Check this out. All right. We're going to make life easy for you. And by the way, if you download the resource guide down there below, it's going to include this, all right? Makes life really easy. I'm going to tell you, always read the labels. The labels are going to tell you where to, where to put everything, all right? That's going to make life a lot easier because according to the National Fire Protection Association, all right, they help put on uh, Fire Prevention Week, Fire Prevention Month, which is always October. Right, according to them, they recommend that smoke alarms, they be on every level, all right, and near every bedroom. All right, now this map right here, it's got a couple images. The red circle is indicative of a smoke alarm placement. All right, the blue rectangle, that's for carbon monoxide. All right, and these can also be combination ones, all right? So think strategically of that. Green circle, that's the only anomaly right there. We're not gonna really talk about it, but that's for a heat alarm. A heat alarm is a good option to go with in a garage because you know what? Smoke detectors, they were not designed to be in a garage because of fumes, dust, things like insects, uh, humidity and temperature change. There's a lot of factors that, that make a, a smoke alarm not effective in a garage. So consider putting a, a heat alarm in there. All right, now, the guide that we're giving you that you can download, this one right here, it, it's also going to articulate escape ladders. We'll talk about that soon. And fire extinguishers placement. All right, we're going to talk about this. This is your best friend, right? This is another line of defense or proactive offense, if you will, to keep you safe and sound. So download the resource. Trust me, you're going you're gonna to appreciate that. All right, now, you know what it is now? Uh, what time? Let's see. Oh, hey, it's fire extinguisher time. That's what time it is. Let's talk about this elephant in the room, right? It's bright. It's red. It comes in different colors. Sometimes you see them white, too. Uh, we'll talk about uh, what's really important to look at when you're looking at fire extinguishers. Because, again, according to that National Fire Protection Association, NFPA, they recommend a fire extinguisher be on every level of your home. You saw it on the map before, especially in places like your garage, your kitchen right here. Really important. All right. Sometimes you can even have it in your car. In fact, I, I remember, according to DOT laws, when I was uh, working some uh, large event production uh, campaigns, we had to have a fire extinguisher in our kit. All right. So really important have it in your car, too. Why not? Now, these are, are good to keep in mind because they're going to – give you that opportunity that if you have to deal with a fire, uh, this is going to give you that opportunity to escape safely if you need to. All right, so always keep them always uh, in, an, in a pathway that allows you to exit safely. All right, now again, keep in mind that if you're not confident in your ability to use this, that's okay. Baby steps. Get out, get to a safe place, and then call 911. All right, you can get training and additional resources later but just get yourself safe and sound in your family. 
All right, but when the time comes that you need to use a fire extinguisher, here's a couple of things you want to make sure that everyone has left the home, all right, or is at least in the process of leaving, all right? And if the fire department hasn't been called, call them, all right? Call 911, call them, call them, call them. If that fire is small and it's not spreading and there's not much smoke, go ahead. You're good to go. Use that fire extinguisher. But if your back is to the exit and you can quickly leave if need be, that's really important, right? Because you want to be able to do what you got to do and then head out so you can be safe and sound, right? This is a really, this is a detrimental chemical when you spray it. I mean, that compounded with the smoke, this is a, a tough area to breathe. You don't want to be there uh, when all of that goes down. Now, if you ever look at a fire extinguisher closely, you might wonder why, all right? And you might wonder why it has all these letters and the alphabet. You're like, why, why is the alphabet on this? Well, there's a good reason why. Those, those letters, A, B, C, it's easy as one, two, three to understand what they're suited for. It's a rating system. Each letter corresponds to what type of fire it can handle. All right, so common residential fire sources, uh, there's essentially three classes. All right, so the first class is A. All right, these are rated for fires like wood. Uh, what about plastics, paper, cloth, even rubber, right? So that's what class A rating is for. That B rating is rated for fires involving things that are, are flammable liquids, right? We talked about that grease fire before. B rating takes care of that. So kitchen grease, uh, gasoline, oil, uh, any kind of solvent or oil-based type paint, those are going to be suited for that. The last one, C-class rating are for fires that are involving energized electrical equipment. So think about uh, any type of wiring in your home. If you live in an older home, right, those wires may be fraying over time. It's a suitor for that. Circuit breakers, uh, machinery, electronics, even appliances. That's what that C rating is suited for. Right, so ABC fire extinguishers, it can use, be used for all of these type of fires and Sometimes you can get different combinations, right? So this is an ABC rated fire extinguisher, but sometimes they come in a BC or an AB combination, right? Just kind of consider what you need uh, depending on your situation. All right, now this is great information and I wish it was just a simple way to teach you how to use a fire extinguisher. Huh, wish that was possible. Oh, look at that. How about an acronym? Boom, we got it, right? Pass. I mean, listen, it's really simple. Pass, pass, pass. P is for pull. A is for aim, squeeze, sweep. What does that mean in terms of this? First, remember that. Pass, pull, aim, squeeze, sweep. Repeat it. That's how you get better and know it, and then you're going to be confident in using this. So when we're talking about pull, that P, that stands for pulling the pin. All right, take a look. That pin right there, that's what you're going to pull when you're ready to use this. All right, the A stands for aim. You're gonna aim that nozzle of that hose towards the base of whatever fire you're trying to address, all right? So aim at the base of that fire. S stands for squeeze. You're gonna squeeze that lever slowly, all right? So nice and slow. And when you're aim and you're squeezing, now you're ready for the final S, which stands for sweep, all right? You're gonna sweep side to side. It's a side to side motion moving towards the fire again towards the base of that fire, sweep is the final motion, take care of it, good to go, goodbye fire, hopefully, right? Now, don't try to fight the fire unless your extinguisher is fully charged and pressurized, right? So that needle, there's a little gauge on here, we're gonna show you that, that's gotta be in the green zone, right? And leave immediately if the room fills with smoke or if that extinguisher you just used, it's done, it's gone, and the fire is still burning, right? Get training. If you want to feel more confident, reach out to your, to your local fire department. The chances are they're going to have events, videos, tutorials, in-person uh, training to make you more confident. Because remember, you know you have, how you have to check those detectors throughout your home regularly? Well, you got to check these regularly too because these guys, they get lonely. They get jealous if you don't pay attention to them. All right, so that means check the gauge. Here's what you want to look for. You want to look at the gauge, you want to look at the body. All right, so when you're looking at the body, inspect it for dents, uh, rusting, all right? Rusting, very common on older type of, uh, of fire extinguishers. 
with aluminum construction, you might see rusting around that uh, surface area. And while you're at it, check the hose or the nozzle for any type of damaged tears or even dry rot, right? Now to see if, if a non-refillable extinguisher needs replacing, talk about that gauge, you're gonna look at it. Take a look up close right there. Check that pressure gauge once a month. In fact, I said read the labels, the instruction manuals, they actually have a little chart that wants you to fill it out with the information of how often you're checking it and what your weight rating is, what uh, color it's in. All right, so this is really important too. You gotta tear off that piece of paper, fill it off and attach it. And so, all right, there it is. It's a little copy there, kiddo. I mean, this is gonna be pretty common with any brand or type of extinguisher you get. So what else is really important when you're looking at these fire extinguishers? Well, if you've got a refillable one, you're gonna do the same physical and pressure gauge check that you did with the non-refillable one. And then if it needs to be refilled, just go ahead and take it to uh, your local fire uh, department for an annual checkup, all right? They're gonna help you out. Now, generally speaking, these fire extinguishers are gonna last 10 to 12 years. This one specifically is rated for 12 years. Uh, so that's the lifespan of that. Uh, so just again, read the labels. It's going to tell you what you need to know. Now, this would be all for nothing. If we went through all of this information, right? And we didn't have a plan. If you fail to plan, you're going to plan to fail, which is why making an escape plan, a fire escape plan is so important. And it's the final step. All right. So what do we need to do? It's a little bit of homework, all right? So it's a little bit of homework, but it's really important to be proactive, all right? Because if your, hand, if your family doesn't have a, a fire escape plan, you gotta create one. Make sure it includes things like two exits or two ways out of every room, all right? Which is usually gonna be a door and a window, all right? And if you have a multi-story home, you need to have some type of escape ladder. We're gonna talk about that. And it has to be near a window uh, in an upper floor. Keeping windows accessible. I can tell you, growing up in New York City apartments, it's very common. A lot of windows were covered with bars with some type of screen. So these bars or, or screens, they should have some kind of quick release fastener. Right? That way no one is trapped inside and they have to escape. Right? Talk about this plan. Practice it with the family. Right? Try to do it twice a year. If you remember when you were in school, you would do fire drills. That really is super important. So make sure you're vigilant on discussing it and practicing, practice, practice, practice. All right, now once you're doing all of this, you also wanna make sure you're, you're staying up to date on, on any new tips and tricks on, on dealing with fires, on preventing fires, on dealing with fires in general. All right, designate family members to be responsible to get babies, if you have babies, if you have small children or pets, right? Everybody should have a task. All right now, ensure there's a backup also, right? And just in case if something happens, right? You want to plan for every type of scenario. Now, this plan will succeed if you also designate a safe place to meet afterwards, somewhere away from your home, so that you're not kind of in turmoil and distress and trying to figure out how to get in touch with, with your loved ones. Designate that place beforehand, all right? Become familiar with evacuation routes in general, especially if you live in, in an apartment. Uh, become familiar with that. You know, they literally have fire escapes in, in New York City. Apartment buildings, fire escapes are so common. All right, just become familiar with that. And if you're a big traveler like me, well, make sure that when you check into whatever lodging, you're familiar with the place. The escape routes, same story, holds true for that. Now, y'all gotta be teachers. We have to teach one another. It takes a village to thrive and succeed. So make sure you teach all household members common things like stop, drop, and roll. All right, don't forget about that. That's really helpful. If your clothes catches on fire for whatever reason, stop, drop, and roll. All right, it's going to be a life lifesaver right there. And also teach your children how to dial and how to speak to 911 operators. Right, really important. Teach them 911. And you know what's really important is becoming familiar with the sound of fire safety, All right? That's gonna make this plan even more effective because think about a fire in your home. You wanna ask yourself this question. 
What do you do if you hear a fire or a smoke alarm? Are you familiar? Do you know what those sounds, those chirps mean? All right, get familiar with that because when you hear that sound, your first instinct, your first reaction should be to get out, stay out, and call 911, all right? Safety, safety, safety. Because when a fire happens, it's crazy, it could be very scary, and so you wanna be prepared. As you're exiting, if you're in your bedroom and the door's closed, before you even make contact with that door, you wanna use the back of your hand to touch and feel if there's any warmth on that door, all right? This is really helpful, again, like I said, because if, if, that door is warm, you want to use that second exit or that second way out that you identified, which is probably going to be a window, right? Now, when you exit, get low and go. All right, that's the tip. That's the trick. Get low and go. All right, y'all. I mean, this kid you see right here, he's got the right idea. All right, especially when there's visible smoke. This is where acting like a child is literally appropriate, especially as an adult. All right. So you want to get low. You want to go because this is the best air, all right? Typically one to two feet above the ground is where the best air is above the floor, all right? So you got to crawl, crawl, push forward, even if you have to go through smoke just to get yourself out towards that exit right now. I got to give a shout out to my boy. I used to be a big basketball fan back in the day. So to Kevin Mutombo, no, 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 nothing in my house. And this is all about blocking fires from spreading. So as you're making your way out, Make sure to close those doors behind you, all right? That's going to help delay the spread of fires. I can tell you that's really crucial, all right, mitigating. Now, if you're in a, in a situation where you have an elevator, don't use the elevator, all right? That's going to be typically for condos, right, or apartments that have elevators. Don't use it in a, in a situation of a fire. No bueno, not good. Now, I know some of you watching you may own multi-story homes like i talked about right and and unless you're living in lifestyles of the rich and famous or or even mtv cribs chances are you don't have an elevator in your home so what do you do in your multi-story home uh if you're upstairs in the bedroom or upstairs in the hallway you hear the alarm and now you realize you can't exit because you just felt the back of of that doorway or that first exit way with the back of your hand and it's warm, right? What do you do? What do you do? Well, escape ladders are going to come to the rescue, all right? This is allowing for a second way, for instance, uh, escaping from like an upstairs bedroom, like I mentioned. So you want to make sure that these escape ladders, if you got one, if you get one, they got to be accessible near a window, all right? The entire family should become comfortable with using that ladder, all right? So you got to get over your fears of heights if you have them. I can tell you, I've, I've had a, I, have, I have a healthy fear of heights, but I push myself to get, to get more comfortable, and I do it. So it gets me a little uncomfortable, but you can do it too. Now, make sure children know how to open windows. It seems like common sense, but again, this is the difference maker. All right, and then review this annually, because again, practice, practice, practice. All right, it's going to make you a better homeowner and protect your loved ones. Now, the features, the advantages, the benefits, they're easy to see with escape ladders because... Simply put, they're just designed to do that, right? They're designed to escape. They're designed to hook on to a window frame, right? They provide a very, very sturdy method of escaping that room, and they're made to be easily stored under the bed. Or maybe you want to put it in a closet. Uh, some homes even go for a permanent little housing and an access panel. I mean, the choice is yours. The key is make it accessible, all right? And it's easy to store. Great benefits of this. Now, whether you currently own an escape ladder or several, or you're looking to purchase some in the future, consider the length of the ladder, right? If you have a two-story home, you're gonna look for a length of about 15 feet. Uh, if you have a three-story home, think about 25-foot length uh, ladder. That's right, rule of thumb. Some other important aspects are, uh, there's something called a standoff, and these are curved metals that hold the ladder away from that side of the house, right? So the ladders with a, with a bigger standoff, they're gonna be a little more stable and easier to use, uh, and it's really helpful. Check the load limit too, what that weight capacity, that max weight capacity listed. Again, read the labels. The labels is gonna give you all the information on that. And then you're gonna check the ladder material, right? Steel ladders are more durable, but plastic ladders, they, they might not hold up uh, really hot fires, right? They may bow, they may split, so just think about that. 
Now, the type of way that it drops to the ground is really helpful if you have a home with uh, consider like balconies or, or gables, porches, anything like that. You're going to want a ladder that has flexibility and versatility for that. Uh, so something that's a, of a web construction is going to be really good in that situation. Now, as we make our escape and bring this workshop to a close, because I know Antonio, it was, that was a lot. We covered a lot. And it's good because all of this fire content is really important and is relevant. And so what I want to do is I want to challenge you to ask yourself, what is the one thing that you learned from this workshop? And if the answer aligns with any of the topics that we have listed within this summary, then I got to give you a big shout out, kudos, congratulations, because that's thanks to the hard work that you're doing. Reach out to us, all right? You can contact us. Uh, the email address is workshopslive at homedepot.com, right? Because hopefully you can say with confidence, Antonio, I understand the different fire hazards in my home. I'm capable of forming a championship worthy defense of detection. I'm going to pass. I'm going to pass the fire extinguisher, P-A-S-S, and ultimately form an achievable successful fire escape plan for me and my family. So I just want to say on behalf of myself and the entire team at the Home Depot, gracias, cuídate, thank you, and be well. Oh, and a huge, huge thank you to all of the first responders out there who answer when duty calls with fire safety. Thank you.